All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. For those of you who didn't uh, hear the first time, I'm Dr. Ryan Truchlet of Weather Tiger, and tonight I will be covering the very latest on very dangerous Hurricane Ian, which is poised to enter the southeastern Gulf of Mexico early tomorrow and uh, threatens Florida as a major hurricane uh, Wednesday and onward. So this is uh, Hurricane Ian. It's currently moving west-northwest. It's going to cross uh, western Cuba overnight and move into the Gulf of Mexico tomorrow. And it's looking very much like the classic hurricane. In fact, it even kind of looks like the hurricane symbol uh, right now. And uh, that's a sign that it is intensifying tonight. So I'd like to start by talking about the key messages that the National Hurricane Center would like to convey to the public for uh, Hurricane Ian, the very most important things you need to be aware of. And in Florida, those three things to be aware of are uh, number one, the danger of life-threatening storm surge along much of the Florida West Coast. Uh, there's been a storm surge warning issued for a lot of the Florida Gulf Coast already, highest risks in the Fort Myers to Tampa Bay region. Uh, in particular, Tampa Bay, this could be a truly catastrophic surge event. Uh, and National uh, Hurricane Center really wants to make clear that that is the key risk here from Ian to the west coast of Florida. Another key uh, message they want to convey is that hurricane force winds are expected in the hurricane warning area uh, of west central Florida beginning Wednesday morning and potentially extending through Thursday. And then also there's the key threat of heavy rainfall, which is going to be widespread across the Florida Peninsula and at least the eastern half of the Panhandle uh, with Ian. And that's likely going to continue into Friday or Saturday. So three key threats. We've got surge, we've got rain, and we've got wind. So this is the very latest Hurricane Center forecast track as of the 8 p.m. intermediate advisory. Uh, maximum sustained winds 100 miles per hour. That makes Ian a category two on the Saffir-Simpson hurricane wind scale. It's likely to become a category three before crossing western Cuba. And then in, when it's in the southeastern Gulf of Mexico, uh, likely topping out as a category four. Uh, as it, the National Hurricane Center current track bends uh, Ian back to the north-northeast and slows the storm down as it approaches the Tampa Bay region late Wednesday into early Thursday. Uh, so that has been a little bit of a shift uh, over the last 24 hours. Uh, these are the older NHC forecast tracks over here, kind of in the light blue, and the newer ones here in, the, in dark blue. And those forecasts have edged closer to Tampa Bay as time has gone on over the last 36 hours. So not good news for the Tampa Bay region, certainly. Uh, this is the National Hurricane Center intensity forecast and really not much of a change over the last 24 hours. Uh, Ian has been steadily intensifying and is likely to be a Cat 3 soon, peak out as a Cat 4 uh, late tomorrow into early Wednesday. No change with that forecast there over the past few days. So let's take a quick look at what Ian is up to tonight. Uh, this is Initially this is the visible uh, picture from the satellites and then it switches over to infrared when it gets dark. And what we can see here is that the center of Ian is right in here, and there's deep, deep convection uh, ringing that circulation center. So again, that's indicative of a strengthening hurricane, a well-organized storm, uh, and something that's gonna continue to intensify at least for the next 24 to 36 hours, while it's in a very favorable environment for development. So Air Force Reserve Hurricane Hunter aircraft are flying around through this thing. Uh, Air Force and NOAA have been flying this all day. And every time they fly through the center, uh, you get one of these, what's called a center fix, and uh, they're finding a lower and lower minimum surface pressure, again, indicating that Ian is intensifying. They're also finding that it's starting to turn more towards uh, the north-northwest, and it'll probably take on more of a due north track overnight as it crosses western Cuba. Uh, additionally, they are finding winds that are not quite up to major hurricane intensity, yet they found some flight-level winds of just under 100 knots, um, and that's just short of what you'd expect from a Category 3, so it'll likely be there soon. So what's going to be driving the forecast here over the next 24 hours? Well, these are the winds uh, about uh, four miles up in the atmosphere, and that's kind of the layer of the atmosphere that drives the... Um, that's, that's, the that's the layer of the atmosphere that's steering a hurricane. And you can see this big dip in the jet stream over the eastern United States uh, is it's pushed the subtropical high pressure ridges way out of the way and they're over here and over here 
and that's, that's what's lifting Ian north into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, so that's going to continue moving north and then start to bend a little bit back to the north-northeast as we go into Wednesday. And models are in very good agreement on this. I don't want to belabor the point here, but models were in disagreement a couple days ago, and now they're pretty closely aligned with each other. This is the forecast for uh, Ian's position uh, across four of the major global models uh, as we head into Wednesday night, and they're all very close to or just southwest of the Tampa Bay area uh, at you know two, uh, two days out from now. So the tricky part of the forecast is uh, that while we're in good agreement about what's gonna happen over the next 48 hours or so, uh, in that Ian's gonna get very close to Tampa Bay, what happens beyond that time uh, is a little bit trickier because that deep trough is gonna start moving out of the Eastern United States. And that's gonna leave behind in the vicinity of Ian, a much weaker steering current environment. So uh, it's not gonna be booking north, northeast anymore. It's gonna slow down right along the coast and potentially turn north, potentially even turn back north, northwest. And it may even do that uh, when it's inland as well. So that's the real trick to the forecast here. So you can take a look at the GFS and the Euro ensembles. They're in pretty good agreement, but you know, some of these ensemble members, when uh, Ian is slowing down Wednesday night. Some of them are on the coast. Some of them have already made landfall. Some of them are very close to the coast, and some of them are a bit farther offshore. More of the GFS members are a little bit farther offshore, uh, but there's a pretty even distribution there. And that makes a huge difference. If it's onshore, close to the shore, or away from shore, that really is going to tell the tale of who gets the worst impacts and when they occur and how long they last. So, we don't really know exactly when that's going to be because we don't know uh, how close Ian will be to the shore or whether we'll be onshore uh, late Wednesday and early Thursday. So let's talk about uh, let's talk about some impacts that are expected no matter which of those scenarios plays out. And the first one that I want to draw to your attention is storm surge. Uh, Ian is going to be a Category Four hurricane when it's in the southeastern Gulf of Mexico, and it's going to be driving a a large wind field pushing a wall of water towards southwest Florida and towards the Tampa Bay region. So right now the National Hurricane Center is calling for storm surge in Tampa Bay itself of five to 10 feet, uh, in southwest Florida of between four and eight feet, uh, all the way south to Bonita Beach, and then about three to five feet through the Keys, um, Naples region, Marco Island area. And there's also the potential for five to eight foot storm surge further north uh, into the nature coast and provisionally right now given the NHC forecast the surge would be somewhat lower in Appalachie Bay on the order of one to four feet uh, but that could change if the track deviates further to the west with that slow motion. A track further offshore would eventually bring more surge into Appalachie Bay. So uh, the other key threat that I want to bring up is that's not really a function of which of those exact forecast tracks uh, Ian takes is rainfall. Ian is going to be moving slowly from Wednesday, Thursday, perhaps even Friday, and might be as late as Saturday before this thing moves out to the northeast. And all that time, there's going to be heavy rainfall, uh, especially kind of near and then east and north of the center. So that slow forward motion means that most of the Florida Peninsula can expect uh, five to 10 inches of rainfall with local totals uh, along the west central Florida coast of anywhere from 10 to 15 inches of rainfall. And that's just kind of the opening guess right now. That could go higher uh, if the track slows down further. And that is going to bring in the potential for uh, flash flooding, inland flooding uh, as well. We're not just talking about storm surge flooding and, and huge waves causing coastal flooding. We're talking about the potential, some serious potential for flash flooding inland especially in lower lying and poorer drained areas. These areas that are in red have a moderate risk of flash flooding. Uh, this is just through early Thursday, and that threat will continue, and it'll spread further north and east uh, into the Big Bend and into the eastern panhandle, um, likely on Friday as well, which is not reflected on this map at this time. So this is a, a seven-day uh, outlook of rainfall uh, for the southeastern U.S. and all these areas that are kind of in this yellow or brown, those are all areas where we can expect five to 10 inches of rainfall. 
you know, there's going to be local variability with that, but, you know, just dropping five or 10 inches of rainfall on some of these areas is going to result in river flooding, flash flooding, uh, and that's a very serious threat as well. So what I haven't discussed yet are winds. And I haven't discussed winds yet because the wind impacts are more dependent on exactly how far the storm goes offshore in a way that surge really isn't. You know, you might think that surge uh, is you need to make landfall for there to be you know, deep, surge deep into Tampa Bay, but that's not true. Even if the storm is, say, 50 miles offshore, you've got those strong winds out of the southwest that are going to be driving that wall of water into southwest Florida the Bradenton, the Sarasota, Port Charlotte, Fort Myers region, and Tampa Bay itself. So whether you have a landfall or whether the track is relatively close to the shore, say within 50 miles, the surge threat exists and is very, very serious. That's really the, the key takeaway. If you're in a surge, uh, low-lying surge-prone evacuation area, you need to leave uh, if you receive an evacuation order. Don't think to yourself that you've seen events like this before. The last major hurricane to hit the Tampa Bay region uh, was the Tarpon Springs hurricane of 1921 that came in like this at this Cat 3. So unless you are 110 years old, you have not seen a storm like this. Uh, you need to heed evacuation orders uh, if you receive them. Now, moving on to the wind threat. That is more dependent on the exact track. Uh, if you see landfall or a scrape very close to the coast, the areas that are highlighted in purple are those that are likely to see wind gusts potentially over 100 miles per hour. These areas that are highlighted in red with the current Hurricane Center forecast track will see hurricane force wind gusts. And these areas that are in yellow and orange are going to potentially see tropical storm force wind gusts uh, in those areas. So the wind damage area right now, the area of greatest concern is this area in red and purple. Uh, but that could change because we really don't know once this storm on Wednesday night gets into this area, if it's going to continue moving northeast, slow down and move north, or even move northwest um, slowly over the next couple days after that. So this is just one model of something that, uh, that Ian might do. This is the 18Z uh, European model, and it shows very slow motion inland uh, just south of the Tampa Bay area uh, and then kind of a stall after that and very slow movement uh, to the north inland over west central Florida. Uh, another possibility, uh, this is the h -Wurf model, this is the U.S. kind of hurricane model. I'm going backwards in time here. Um, so this is now, it moves forward uh, across western Cuba, still deepening, still strengthening into early Wednesday, bends back a little bit to the north northeast, gets close to Tampa Bay, overnight Wednesday into Thursday, uh, and then kind of starts to weaken and drift north a bit, uh, still at hurricane intensity, making landfall in the Big Bend region near Cedar Key or Steenhatchee early on Friday. This is, again, this is just a model, but it's another scenario. It's one where there's not a landfall in the Tampa Bay region, but it still gets close enough to cause very serious uh, surge, wave, and wind impacts. You know, with the position of the storm here, it's really driving water straight up into Tampa Bay. And that is uh, a very, very serious scenario. That's really something that keeps hurricane forecasters up at night. Just wanna mention one more thing uh, for North Florida, for the Panhandle, for the Big Bend. Uh, this, if it does get further north and remain offshore, it may not look like a traditional hurricane. So this is, again, this is the h -Worf model. This is kind of simulated satellite what it thinks it would look like from space. So Tuesday into Wednesday, very much looks like a hurricane. Uh, then the environment starts to degrade a little bit, shear and dry air kind of pick up on Thursday, start to weaken the storm. If, if it does remain offshore, likely will be weakening. And then as you go into Friday, the shear really gets the best of, uh, of Ian. And it doesn't look much like a traditional hurricane as it's moving inland over the Big Bend. But you don't need to have something look like a classic hurricane to do widespread surge, wave, and heavy rainfall and flash flooding uh, damage across the state of Florida. So right now, again, we know that this will be in the vicinity of Tampa Bay on Wednesday night. We don't know if it'll be making landfall Wednesday night or it'll be kind of scraping along the 
uh, the nature coast for a couple more days after that. We do know that there's going to be widespread surge and, and uh, wave impacts, widespread heavy rainfall impacts across the state. Damaging wind impacts are likely. We will see who gets the worst of it and how bad that is. That's still uh, yet to be pinned down completely. But So I just did want to take a quick look at the comments to see if, um, if there's some questions that, uh, that I can address tonight. Um, let's see. How will the winds drop so much from a four to a one for landfall? If it turns more east, can it hit land as a four? Great question. Yes. If Ian is making landfall on Wednesday, it is likely to do so as a major hurricane, as a three, potentially even as a four. That's because the environment that it will be in on Wednesday will still be relatively favorable for hurricanes to thrive. Sheer dry air pickup on Thursday and Friday, and that's why uh, that, she, that dry air gets pushed into the hurricane's core and it can really disrupt uh, a hurricane very quickly. So that's why uh, even if it stays offshore, it would likely drop several wind categories. But you know, the surge impacts don't come down quickly. They don't fall off the same way that wind impacts can, can kind of fall, fall off a cliff. Um, once you've built up that wall of water, it's got to go somewhere. So I don't want people to be too keyed into what the category is here because uh, surge is going to be uh, in a different category, uh, you know, if it's still out over the water on Thursday. Um, how far inland is storm surge likely to go in Fort Myers area? You should refer to a product on the National Hurricane Center's webpage uh, that will allow you to take a look at your exact location and what the possible inundation would be with the track. Uh, for Jacksonville, Jacksonville, this is primarily going to be a heavy rain threat. Going back to the, uh, the seven day precipitation plots, you're talking about potentially 10 inches of rainfall in Jacksonville in the next uh, five to seven days. And that's going to be uh, at a high risk of flash flooding, especially in those lower lying areas of Jacksonville. Um, finally, what is the likelihood of the storm shifting back to the west? And is it a threat to the Big Bend area? Yes, uh, there is a possibility that, uh, uh, that basically Ian stays further offshore and you know, it doesn't quite make landfall. It's maybe you know, 75 miles off the coast and then these, in these weak steering winds kind of drifts north and comes into Appalachie Bay uh, potentially sometime on Friday. If it does so, the key impact in North Florida is going to be very high storm surge and wave activity along the, this lens-shaped bay uh, of Appalachian Bay. That water is going to get pushed ahead of the storm and it's going to cause uh, you know, a, a lot of storm surge inundation on that kind of forecast track. Heavy rain will also be a significant concern, especially because it'll probably start to rain on Wednesday across at least the Big Bend, maybe even in the eastern panhandle, and certainly further south across the panhandle. It's already raining in South Florida now. Um, wind impacts, I would say primarily would be along the coast, likely because the storm would be weakening if it does come into eastern panhandle or Big Bend. Weakening storms don't bring uh, damaging winds inland as effectively as strengthening storms do. So I'm a little bit less concerned about that uh, if Ian gets up our way in Tallahassee, but I'm very concerned about the threat for uh, Big Bend and Appalachian Bay storm surge um, damage in, in, that, in that case. Now, if, this, if the storm does go into the nature coast and the Big Bend is on uh, the west side of the storm, you will not have that same kind of surge impact because you'll have those offshore winds, so you won't be piling water into Appalachian Bay the same way. All right, uh, I think I'm gonna wrap up there. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, I hope I have addressed your questions. So once again, this was Dr. Ryan Truchelet of Weather Tiger. You can visit us at weathertiger.com for more. And uh, stay tuned, keep watching the skies. It's, uh, it's gonna be a long week, folks. Take care.